Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Among the uh, variety of news items we have for you, we have the uh, mysterious Alaska pox that has been showing up for the last nine years, rather unsurprisingly, in Alaska. The possible risk that herpes may have with regards to developing dementia. DNA analysis of Beethoven has unexpected results that may or may not surprise you. Archaeology finds a uh, well-preserved Roman-era egg, although uh, whoever had the brilliant idea to open it should be punished given the laboratory smell. Norway approves GMO canola oil. Scientists have been able to uh, visualize and, more accurately, observe electrons moving in real time in water. Something truly amazing. Whether it's safer to be dry or wet during a lightning storm, although arguably whether you're dry or wet is the least of your concerns. When the decimal point was first used, NASA recruiting individuals for a simulated year-long mission to Mars, and where the last missing planet from our solar system is hiding. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Starting with yet another mysterious disease, although it's only a mystery until you find out what the hell is going on, Alaska pox. Alaska pox first started showing up around 2015. It was a relatively mild illness with joint pain, muscle pain, swollen lymph nodes, and often a bump or two on the skin, occasionally pustules, but nothing that was egregious. The reason it's become noteworthy at the moment is that somebody has finally died from it. Admittedly, their death is not that surprising. Because of treatment for cancer, and unfortunately, that does utterly decimate their immune system. Because of that, their death was always going to be likely if they developed any illness, let alone a mysterious illness. Further to the rather obvious issues of someone dying, it's the distance between the first known individual who had this and the person who has died. 500 kilometers or a bit over 300 freedom units. That's a long way for the disease not just to have traveled, given we have no idea what it is, but then to have found somebody that it could kill. What makes particularly important developments for this is that it shows Alaska pox has spread far more than previously estimated, and because of that, and the fact that it's an unknown disease, there not only needs to be more awareness of it, but they really need to figure out what the hell is going on. The only current guesstimates as to what's happening is that it may be spread by red-black voles and shrews. That then raises the question of how it gets from the uh, small animals to the human, and are uh, likely through something like a flea bites or similar, but it's unknown, and therein lies the problem. Uh, mystery illnesses are always fun. After all, we spent two years in lockdown due to the last time we had uh, such an unknown outbreak. We also have a uh, new way to treat diseases that are resistant, or more specifically, a bacteria that are resistant to treatment. It's a, a new antibiotic from Harvard, and theoretically, it should address a, a large part of the antibiotic resistances that are out there. Understand? This is a very preliminary claim, but in theory, it's sound. The new drug as a family is called a chrysomycin, and it's already been tested against things like Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Two kinds of bacteria that are particularly known to be uh, likely to develop antibiotic resistance. Where this works is somewhat uh, distinct and unusual from the other antibiotics that are out there. Although, then again, that is what all the antibiotics say. Preomycin is uh, meant to uh, target the uh, bacterial cell ribosome, rather than targeting the bacterial cell membrane. The distinct functionality is helpful in that, rather than worrying about uh, peptidoglycan, which, when the target, means you're really liable to more effectively affect peptidoglycan-positive or gram-positive bacteria, 
This can target a gram positive or those bacteria with a thick peptidoglycan wall. This targets a, a universal thing. The ribosomes being essential for protein synthesis. No protein synthesis, no bacterial function. And this means that no new bacteria and the existing bacteria will die. The way the team has made their particular antibiotic work well against antibiotic resistant bacteria is that they've worked around the largely known and existing methods of protecting bacteria from antibiotics. This has included enzymes that will break down anything trying to target the ribosome. In this case, they've been able to avoid those issues by preforming the antibiotic in such a way that the bacteria can't differentiate between its intended target, that is, the actual amino acids that are going into the ribosome, or the products coming out of it, and this drug. And therefore, there's no way to have an enzyme that will effectively target it. In uh, further disease-related news, we have the idea that herpes uh, may not just make you look unattractive, uh, but double your risk of dementia, or at least a study is claiming such a major result. It is, uh, as with many studies like this, retrospective, so we can't exactly say it's perfect. Uh, but then again, infecting a whole bunch of people with herpes virus and seeing what happens in the long term is also just as unviable. The long-term study from Sweden involved about a thousand individuals, all over 70, to see whether or not they developed neurological conditions, specifically things like dementia. The concept itself is not very novel. It's in fact very old, way back to the start of the 20th century old. But at the time, there was just no substantial evidence to support it. And uh, therein lies the problem. It wasn't until near the 21st century that we were able to start finding evidence of it, and this is down to genetic techniques. The technology involved simply wasn't available. What they found since the 1990s is that the herpes simplex virus, DNA from it, was found in the brains of those who had Alzheimer's disease and dementia. About 90% of the protein plaques contained some of this DNA and that this was an indicator that it played a major role in the immunological response that was tied to the cognitive decline of the individuals involved. Of course, there are a range of reasons why this might be showing up and why it is that this research is not definitive. One of the simplest is that it's a relatively small cohort who are all elderly and therefore there are things to do with exposure, whether or not they've been immunized for this, that, or the other, and so on. And as such, it's very hard to say that there's any definitive link. There is circumstantial evidence, but nothing definitive, which means that unlike something like Law and Order, you're never going to be able to fandangle a jury into accepting it. In other neurological news, we have ways to hack your brain, although sadly not new age hacking, which might be a lot easier. Instead, it has to do with prosthetics, which are generally far more invasive and more expensive than New Age hippie nonsense. The uh, basic idea behind this research is that where you would have to go to a, a hip therapist or a, a very questionable psychiatrist and get given uh, shrooms, this device allows you to recall uh, specific memories using deep brain stimulation. The idea is that the stimulation will help your brain turn on those memories. Admittedly, this is coming out of California, so some of those memories you may not want to remember. California being, well, California. The claims themselves, though, are, to be delicate about this, exaggerated. And not because the theory isn't sound. There is some evidence to support it. Obviously, uh, nothing exceptional, but still, there is something to uh, say that this could work. Or rather, it's the circumstances under which the, uh, the findings were made. The device was being tested for individuals with epilepsy. They decided that while they were poking around in these individuals' brain, they would also see what they could do about stimulating memories. 
which also means there's a very small cohort involved, just 14 adults. So we have a uh, parallel experiment, so to say, in this clinical trial for a different treatment device. And in theory, what they are saying is that if we stimulate the brain with this device for a completely different condition, uh, we get these outcomes. Uh, no, no, this is not what you should be doing. You really need to be using a distinct and independent investigation because it may not work for people who don't have epilepsy. This is not to mention that the results aren't exactly amazing. There's about a 22% accuracy rate for the stimulation to produce the desired results, and it jumps to about 38% when you stimulate it at both sides of the brain. So you basically have a 2 in 5 chance of getting things right. 2 in 5 is not an encouraging number. Shifting from what is very new news to what is investigation of very old news, that being uh, Beethoven and his likely cause of death. To be clear, likely based on the available information and some genetic testing of hair, that is, a hair understood to be from Beethoven. That's because there have been uh, several locks of hair claimed to be from him that have been later proven to not be from Beethoven. In fact, some have been found to be from women, which, despite how progressive we've become, we're still not in the point where we're turning Beethoven, a very definite man, into a very definite woman. What they've found, based on analysis of the known hair samples that are good, is that he appeared to have hepatitis B. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver, given that he apparently did drink quite considerably and his other lifestyle factors, having hepatitis B was basically the death sentence. Admittedly, this doesn't explain his other issues though, such as hair loss and gut pain. There are other theories as to why that might be the case, such as lead poisoning, but some of these have been brought into question as well. In other news that's likely to lead to a combination of laughter and extreme debate, a study examining the relationship between penis size and IQ. The study found in short, bigger PP, smaller brain. Big brain, small PP. Childish descriptions aside, there was a surprising amount of data available and used for this, and the results were, again, surprisingly, uh, let's say, definitive. The data used was about 116,000 males, so we're not talking something insignificant here. Age-wise, it was between 18 and 65, and it had 139 countries, so they've covered most of their bases. They did also adjust for things like GDP, education, things like temperature and BMI. That's important here, as a lot of studies don't bother to do this adjusting for confounding variables, but they have. It is also, uh, let's say, noteworthy that there were notable ethnic differences. This does indicate that it is possible that where you live and, uh, well, to an extent, who you are, you may well have uh, notable benefits from having a larger or smaller penis, with regards to your IQ at least. This nonsense being almost as entertaining as the uh, drama around the penis rat. If you have uh, not been made aware of the penis rat paper, it is a paper that was published in the Frontiers in Cell and Development Biology journal. The Frontiers being a generally accepted to be a good publisher now, although previously they were somewhat questionable and occasionally considered a predatory publisher. This recent shit show has uh, not helped them in that respect. The paper published had a, uh, well, uh, two figures that were concerning. The one that's got the most attention has been the image of a, a rat with a very large penis and testicles, the image being AI generated. Unfortunately for the authors involved, that was only part of the problem here. The other was the second image, which was about the Jack and Stat pathways. This also was AI generated, and again, 
rather concerning. Invariably, uh, given the uh, attention the paper received, it was uh, eviscerated by academics, and uh, there was a, a lot of action on this. So much so that the journal retracted it within 24 hours of publication. Understand, most retractions can take years, and some people very active in identifying misconduct will work for years to try and get an article retracted, because journals are very reticent to do so, but eventually it can and often will happen if you're dedicated enough and willing to aggravate the journal, the squeaky wheel and grease and all that. In this case, it was done in 24 hours, and it's all down to the egregious nature of what they've managed to screw up. Shifting to very old news by comparison to the very current news, we have an ancient Roman-era egg that apparently still has liquid inside of it. A liquid likely to be uh, truly disgusting given how old it is. The egg is about 1,700 years old, and it's considered well-preserved, which is more likely an accurate description of its shell rather than its contents. Not just because the other eggs found at the same time demonstrate just how much danger there is in opening a 1700 year old egg and the uh, disgusting smell released which uh, might be considered an example of uh, biological warfare. In this instance, those eggs, and for that matter this one, can't be handled very well. In fact, the reason why most of them didn't survive the trip to a museum is because they literally cannot be handled with a human hand. They need to be scanned and processed without ever touching the egg directly. The scans of this egg have found that it does contain a liquid, the yolk and white of the egg, but the two are so mixed together that you really can't differentiate them. The only thing to tell you that there are two parts to it is that there's a small air bubble at the top. Shifting to other news, although very current but still animal related. We have a change in the behavior of the European Ibex. The Ibex is effectively a giant goat, just slightly more angry and slightly more mountainous. Why they're noteworthy this week is that there is a change in their behavior. They're shifting from a normal daylight active animal to a nocturnal animal, and this is a risk for them. Unfortunately, as much as you may or may not appreciate it, the parts of Europe still have wolves, and not wolves that will be taking the place of your grandmother or hunting for pigs, but instead other wild animals. In this case, the ibex themselves. And that's the problem. The wolves will hunt at night when the ibex is far less capable of being able to identify them and run away, if it doesn't defend itself given the size of its horns. And this is where the findings get really weird. The idea that was initially driving this is that researchers figured that the Ibex had understood that the threat of wolves was no longer present, and so they naturally just didn't care anymore. But it's the opposite. Instead of being active at night where there's greatest risks from wolves where wolves are not present, it's the other way around. They are instead active in areas where their actions are going to put them in the most danger. The reasons that the researchers give for this are interesting in that they believe that based on the tracking data from 2006 to 2019 that they uh, engage in this activity despite it being high risk on days with high maximum temperatures meaning that they're prioritizing where they avoid being out in the heat and therefore uncomfortable and instead choose to stay where they can be safe and then venture out at night when it's cool and therefore comfortable but they're at risk of being eaten by the wolves. Going from uh, purely animal news and, and environmental news to uh, genetically modified news but news related to canola and aquaculture which it may seem unrelated but there is a good reason why Norway has approved GMO canola for it. Norway is a country that is famous for a variety of reasons. One is its natural beauty, but the second is its long history of fishing. 
whether that is the uh, horrible fishing practices of whaling or whatever the hell they call this fish that's been dried in yeah but otherwise they're famous for fishing one of the things they started doing in the recent decades is to uh, farm fish like salmon in order to farm fish like salmon though they need to provide them with food and one of the foods they provide them with is canola oil canola oil helps with the uh, making of omega-3 fatty acids for the fish which the fish then convert to various other omega fatty acids but it also contributes to the fish's color and size more colorful bigger and more nutritional if they feed them canola oil this is where the genetically modified canola oil is proving useful it is in theory going to help the norwegian fishing industry to make better salmon you may have the inevitable and obvious question of but why do they need to feed them the canola oil and the reason is that the source of this omega-3 oil before now has genuinely been from other fish and mostly wild fish but those fish supplies and stocks are now becoming increasingly stressed and pressured by overfishing and because of that by shifting to the canola oil which can be grown on the land and thereby completely remove some of that pressure from the wild fish stocks without ultimately affecting anything else this compares and contrasts starkly with claims about the USA and its food supply there are claims that there is widespread prevalence of a banned crop chemical now beyond everything else and before we get into the details we need to mention that the uh, group responsible for this publication are a, uh, let's be blunt about it, a known uh, environmentalist group with uh, very clear biases. As such, what they found and the publications that are derived from it need to be taken with a lot of hesitation. Uh, first of all, they're claiming that 4 out of 5 urine samples from people in the USA contain this banned chemical called chlormequat. Yeah. Uh, other than the awkward naming and the ridiculous prevalence, we need to mention the fact that the same group has been known to exaggerate not just the risks of various things like genetically modified foods, uh, but also the uh, various herbicides and pesticides that have been used. So if they're willing to exaggerate the effects, numbers probably don't seem that far off. This brings us to what they actually did. Between 2017 and 2023, they collected 21 urine samples. Yeah, 21. That's not enough to get any significant results. That would be why they then proceeded to collect 50 more samples in June of 2023. However, it is worth us pointing out that the latter 50 samples were only collected in one geographical location, that being Florida. The study itself is grossly flawed because they're now trying to compare those 50 samples against the previous years that are geographically discrete and different and claiming, oh, look at the sudden increase. No, just no. Further to all of that, the small sample size and the uh, bullshit collection process, we do have the fact that there was a change in rules around 2018. In 2018, the USDA and FDA has relaxed rules around importing food from other countries that has contained or at least been exposed to the banned chemical. Now understand exposed to and contained are very different. If you expose something to a banned chemical, the amount left over is what you need to be worried about. And that is where this study gets really dodgy. Not just are they claiming that it contains it, but it contains it in dangerous quantities. It is noteworthy that even some of the organic products that they were assessing for this contained the banned chemical, which theoretically shouldn't be there. This tells us that there's a methodological flaw in what they're doing. 
when even your control group, so to speak, contains the thing that you're trying to find, either your controls aren't very good controls, or your method is shit. Further to all of that, at no point whatsoever does the article appear to actually discuss the issue of limits on the amount that can be present, and, importantly, whether or not the amounts that they've found have any significance. The final and arguably biggest issue with this is that the study has effectively run two parallel investigations and tried to publish them in one paper. One is on the urine content, the second is on food that is being imported. It's important to note that when the authors are discussing this, they do discuss them and there's an uncomfortable amount of overlap where they don't provide the necessary degree of clarity that should be present to say this was established this way for this part of the experiment. While yes, you can find the necessary information, the way it's presented is just a shit show. Overall, this shit show basically can be summarized as a hit piece given the final two paragraphs which summarize all of their findings. First of all, they talk about urine in the study, and they suggest that donors were exposed to levels above the reference dose. Understand, in this case, there isn't a maximum or even a minimum daily dose or exposure. This is just a here is what we believe is a safe and acceptable tolerable level in food. Even the European standards are still way above what they found. Yeah, the European standards are still above, and understand, European standards are generally more restrictive than what they found in their study, and yet they then go on to say, but we think that they should be tighter. Well, no, if there are standards, and these are what they are, they've been set based on the available evidence. Even if there's research to indicate they might be beneficial to restrict them more, clearly the evidence isn't adequate to actually initiate changes in the government that, if you were actually looking at this at a realistic point of view, probably wants to keep their taxpayers alive. This is why the article is basically another hit piece, by no means as bad as the American Academy of Pediatrics shit show, but bad enough. In news that's somewhat more pleasing, purely because it's kind of amazing rather than it's actually something good, the ability to uh, see electrons moving in water in what is almost real time, although the actual movements are more like stop motion photography than actual real time. What the researchers have done is try and uh, pin down the large atom that the electrons are orbiting around, that is to uh, pin the hydrogens and the oxygen that make water in place. Then they proceeded to hit this with x-rays. The x-rays are what cause the uh, change in the electron's activity, and by using that radiation, the x-ray, they're able to get a response that they can then be able to monitor. With this method, they've been able to go from measuring things in what are picoseconds, tiny fractions of a second, ridiculously small amounts of time, to now being able to measure it in attoseconds, which is significantly slower again. In further science news, although this time shifting from a, well, exciting to the uh, surprising, a uh, large survey has found that confidence in science is surprisingly high given some of the various claims and uh, positions of people publicly. The uh, survey of about 70,000 individuals asked them various questions, unsurprisingly given it's a survey, but what they were asking about was how confident they are and how much, let's say, they trust science. Generally speaking, they found that post-COVID-19 pandemic measures, confidence and trust is high, although high across a range of demographics, but not all. The questions focused on things like integrity, competence, benevolence, openness, and similar, giving them a scale of 1 to 5, with 5 being the more trustworthy end of it. 
the average score being 3.62. Where it gets interesting is that respondents believe that scientists had a high competency, a moderate integrity and benevolence, but they were lower or at least less willing to uh, be open to feedback. About 23% of all participants believe scientists pay only a somewhat or very little attention to outside views. Things get, uh, let's say, uh, more complicated when they then started looking at uh, political uh, leaning or affiliation and the uh, view of science as a whole. Depending on the country, this could be a significant factor, but those countries were largely in the minority. Most countries, 41 of the 67, found that there was no association between political orientation and degree of trust. With the concept of trust in mind, investigations as to whether or not you're better off being wet or dry in a lightning storm, which, as we mentioned earlier, probably the least of your concerns, given that you're in the midst of a lightning storm. But the theory is that if you are in a storm, you're going to be wet, and whether or not you get struck by lightning is going to be better or worse for you. Apparently, being wet may increase your chances of survival by up to 90%, which is kind of worrying when you think about it. The research design was fairly straightforward. Create an artificial head, soak it in water, and then take lightning to it, or at least artificial lightning. The outcomes of soaking the head showed that there was less external and internal damage to the analogues of a human head if it was soaked, which is kind of odd, although it can be explained, just the idea of doing so is unusual and probably less than comfortable for you. The theory is that the wet model may have better lightning strike protection because the uh, lightning will follow the water rather than trying to go straight into the squishy inner goodness that is your brain. Uh, the difference, however, is only about a third, so this is not going to keep you alive in a lightning storm necessarily. Also worth noting that lightning is more likely to strike at the same location twice due to the way it affects the electrons in the area and creates a, a more favorable pathway. Yes, you do have a up to 90% greater chance of survival, but 90% greater chance of survival is still not great odds when you're being struck by lightning. Shifting to technology news and somewhat entertaining technology news at that, Air Canada has found itself in trouble because of its chatbot. The chatbot, thankfully, hasn't caused them to have to go broke, which would have been just as hilarious, but rather it demonstrates the dangers of relying on it, from a company perspective anyway. You've likely heard this story, if not, the uh, short version is that an individual had to travel urgently due to a funeral. Air Canada has a policy with regard to travelling and funerals. If you are mourning, they are willing to offer a reduced rate to fly. Having spoken with the chatbot, the individual in question was told you can get the refund of the difference after you have travelled, so long as you provide the necessary documents. They've done so, and it was found that, in fact, that was not what the policy said. In fact, the policy said that you needed to organise all this beforehand, get the ticket at the correct price, and then travel. Since the chatbot had very clearly provided incorrect information, the airline theoretically was liable, but they denied any and all responsibility, arguing that, in fact, the uh, chatbot was not them as such. It was not Air Canada. It was a separate entity, which is kind of terrifying, but ignoring that for now, Air Canada therefore made the case that they're not liable for what the chatbot had mistakenly advised. 
a court in Canada has told Air Canada that it is a nonsensical argument. Air Canada now owes the customer the difference between what they did pay and what they thought they were meant to be paid after receiving refunds for the difference in airfare. Why this particular incident is important, other than the fact it's caused Air Canada to completely shut down its chatbot, this court case and whole situation opens up a situation in which other companies now need to be far more careful with their chatbots and what they are and are not allowed to do. As a result, it could be that we see these uh, far more limited in what they can answer and how they can answer, and also how many companies are going to offer them. Shifting to maths news, we have, well, the first evidence that we know of of the use of the decimal place. It's a 1593 uh, record that shows what appears to be the decimal place. The German mathematician was using it, and this small marker would be one of the more important developments. Except, well, possibly, in 1440, a Italian merchant was also using the same sort of mark. And now, to be very clear about it, the presence of the possible decimal mark is not just not really used very well, as they appear to be rounding up quite considerably, but also the work itself never really gained any traction, and that's perhaps more important here. It's the lack of traction that demonstrates that although, yes, they may have been using it early on, they certainly didn't contribute to its widespread use. In terms of mathematics and numbers, we can increasingly look at being able to store more and more data, and data that often relies on decimal places, and this is where 3D storage could be the next major development. We have gone from having things like handwritten tables to eventually punch cards, and then floppy disks, and then actual physical optical disks to eventually having SSDs. And now the next development could be a 3D storage using light and how this could increase the available storage on something like a optical disc. To be clear about it, this is very early on and if it is proven to be possible, it would be amazing. It would mean the ability to store terabytes, if not petabytes of data, on a single disk. At the moment, your standard computer disk can store about 700 megabytes. A DVD can store up to 4 gigabytes, and your Blu-ray discs a little bit more again. This is why most video games are no longer sold on a physical disk. They're just too big for that to be possible. In theory, and understand this is theory, if you were to use a three-dimensional approach using light as the ability to not only apply the data but also read the data, you could be able to, well, effectively increase the storage by the number of layers of data. The big challenge to this is not so much that you could theoretically create this, the challenge is going to be extracting that data once it's there, uh, partly because anything that you're going to make like this will involve hundreds of layers of these effectively disks that are so thin, and we're talking billionths of a millimeter, and this is going to be ridiculous fractions of an inch tall or thick, and you're going to have these stacked one on top of the other, in a tiny disk, at least tiny in terms of the relative volume of data we're talking about. That is where it gets to be difficult not only to make the data on the disk in the first place, but then to extract it. In fact, to be able to create this, they've had to develop an entire new technology called Aggregation Induced Emission Dye Doped Photoresist, AIE DDPR. It is a uh, entirely novel approach to do this. It's made possible uh, partly because of the uh, light that's used to uh, 
let's say, a copy or write to the disc, but also in part through the dyes that are in the film, the disc that they're using. That film will react to different light in different ways, allowing them to overcome the limitations of digital storage on a disc as we have now. Of course, this is incredibly preliminary and likely not to be seen in any kind of significant way for quite a while yet. Next we have astronomical news, although still based on Earth, with NASA recruiting for a simulated year-long Mars mission. There, after a, a group of individuals to take part in the crew health and performance exploration analog, or CHAPI, that is intended to start in spring of 2025. The idea is to take four individuals and stick them together for a year and work inside a roughly 1,700 square foot, this being somewhere along the lines of 500 square meter, 3D printed habitat at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Texas. The habitat, rather ironically, is called the Mars Dune Alpha. Of course, if you'd like to take part, you will need to have at least a master's degree in a STEM field. This means you need to be an engineer, mathematician, biologist, physicist, chemist, or a computer scientist. This does, of course, mean that, uh, well, you have a, a limited pool of candidates. Nonetheless, if you're interested and you fit the criteria, you may wish to apply. You also need to be willing to put up with people in very close proximity to you for at least a year. Shifting further into space, we have other astronomical news in the form of the Odysseus Lunar Lander. The Odysseus Lunar Lander, or Odysseus to make it simple, was a private enterprise which intended to drop their Lunar Lander on the moon, and it is arguably the first and only time a private company has done so. The company is called Intuitive Machines, and it's rather impressive that a private company has been able to do so. Understand, with the resources of a country behind them, several attempts have been made and failed. While the landing itself is impressive, there's an important reason why we're bringing it up, and that is the Odysseus Lunar Lander was carrying a payload of NASA equipment, and so NASA has, by virtue of the Odysseus Lander, returned to the moon, more than 50 years after they last departed. And don't forget that this same company was also able to deliver a lander a ridiculous distance, safely, and with its final landing process being entirely autonomous. This means that going forwards there is scope for the ability to deliver equipment to Mars without ever having to have an astronaut present and be able to have any involvement of a organization like NASA. Admittedly, NASA is likely to be involved, but it's not necessary. The final news we have for you is all about the solar system's missing planet, and that astronomers have narrowed down where it can be to just one location, although that one location is still quite broad. But the researchers in this final news item for you this week have narrowed down where this planet's going to be, and they have unsurprisingly called it Planet X. The planet is theoretically in existence, but it's way out beyond Pluto. The challenge, therefore, is figuring out where it is and then looking into what it is. But you can't really tell what it is until you find it. This is where researchers using Data Release 2 and previous research have been able to narrow down that location. Understand, we say narrowed down because they've really only gone from having 100% of the possible locations from previous studies to having about 22% of the possible locations. This is not a grand achievement in terms of being able to narrow it down to a very finite area. It's a more finite area, to be clear. Despite having narrowed down the area of space that it's likely to be within, the area that is going to be studied will still take at least two years to figure out if the ninth planet is there. Well, a new ninth planet anyway. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing.
Uh, please do post any comments, questions or suggestions you have below.